recording started. And I want to welcome everybody to our virtual conference. And this is one of our first sessions of the 2013 conference. And I am thrilled to welcome back uh, Tia Simmons, and she's brought along a co-presenter um, this year, Dawn uh, Berkeley. And she's at TechTia on Twitter, and our hashtag is 4 t 2013 My name is Liz Kolb, and I'll be your moderator during this session today. And a couple of quick reminders, if you are applying for the CEUs, they are entirely free, but make sure you've logged in with your full name so you can get uh, credit for the session, and make sure you stay the entire time of the session. And this session is slated for about two hours today. And we will have an evaluation posted at the end of the presentation. And I will try to, to uh, private message anyone who might be having technical issues uh, today. So I will kind of sit in the background and do that today a little bit. And just a couple of quick things. We're using Illuminate today. And a couple of things I want to point out. You are absolutely welcome in the chat room uh, to please post questions and anything that comes up during our discussion today, please add to the discussion. We would love that. Also, we may ask you to click on your green check or your red X that I've highlighted there below your names in the participant window. Please go ahead and do that um, when we ask you to use those functions. And then finally, we may ask you to use, also use some of the whiteboard tools next to the whiteboard. And I'm going to just go ahead and highlight uh, the magic wand tool, which I would love for everybody to go ahead and click on right now. And I would love for you to just click where you are. If you're somewhere in the United States, go ahead and click closest to your region. And if you are outside of the United States, because I know sometimes we are an international conference, um, then please click as close as you can get to where you may be so that we can kind of see where everybody's at. Oh, we looks like we have some Canadians. Arizona, welcome. Oh, Peggy, great to see you too. It's so great to see a lot of familiar names. So in Virginia, North Carolina, probably a little warmer there than it is here today. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the conference. And I'm going to go ahead without further ado and Oops, not thank you quite yet, but without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce Tia Simmons and a little bit of background about Tia. She's an Instructional Technology Coordinator for Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, she desires to work with educators to create strategies for integrating technology and being more productive. Um, she's had over 10 years of technology experience, and she's also helped her school district uh, uh, develop their first one-to-one -one iPad initiative. She is a DENSTAR educator for Discovery Education. She's Smart Board certified. She has all the credentials, and last year she had um, raving reviews of her iPad session. So we warmly welcome Tia back, as well as her co-presenter, Dawn, and I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Tia. All right. Good morning again, everyone. I sincerely um, apologize for the delay this morning. It just seems like Murphy is working in my favor today. Um, and so we are having some technical difficulties, but we're going to proceed right along um, and try to work through getting this information in. So thank you, Liz, uh, for the warm welcome. And, and as always, thank you, um, Michigan 4T, for having us um, this year myself. Um, and my co-presenter, Don Berkeley, um, will be presenting Putting the P in iPad, um, which is a session we actually did at a local conference here in the state of Maryland. Um, and we kind of did some things talking about presentation tools. And I thought, oh, you know, this is really great. Um, I definitely want to bring this back to 4T because there's some things that I learned from last year to this year that I want to share. So we're going to go right in and get started. Um, the first half. I'm actually going to walk through just some of the information about the iPad, um, using it, personalizing it, and then in the latter half, uh, my co-presenter, Don Berkeley, is going to come in, and she's going to talk about some specific apps that you can use for your productivity. So um, 
<clears throat> hopefully we'll have a lot of information for you today that we'll be able to walk through and share and something for you to be able to walk away with. So as Liz mentioned, I do work for Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, it's a very large um, urban school district in the state of Maryland. We have over 200,000 students, so a lot of kids. Um, I've had the fortunate opportunity to support a one-to-one -one iPad initiative at four of our middle schools, um, which was a very interesting process, um, to say the least, and so we're just um, glad to have been able to do that, um, among some of the other things that Liz mentioned in reference just to some of my background and some of my certifications. Um, also, I'd like to introduce Dawn. We're having some difficulties getting her in, but she's coming feverishly. Um, Dawn is actually an AP biology high school teacher at one of the high schools in our district. Um, and this year, as, a, as well as last year, <clears throat> her school um, decided to purchase carts of iPads for the teachers and the students. Um, and so she was designated um, and selected to kind of be the coordinator for all of that. And she's coordinated the PD for her teachers, projects for the students, um, and just tons of support. And I've actually had the honor of supporting her and her projects. So it's been a great opportunity working with her. <clears throat> So let's just jump right on in. Um, when we talk about putting the P in iPad, one of the things that I like to share is that it's all about personalization. The iPad, the software on the iPad is called iOS, um, and the I really is all about I. It's all about us and how we can use these mobile devices to be able to personalize them to do what we need them to do. So <clears throat> I want to talk kind of briefly about two ways to personalize these um, these devices. One is in the settings. A lot of people don't really jump into the settings when they buy the device. Most people are already familiar and accustomed with the device. Oh, I purchase it, I buy it, I know I have to load apps on it, so here we go. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in the settings that I want to go over today that would really help you personalize them. Now again, we're talking about if this is your own individual device or if you're the teacher and <clears throat> excuse me, you're trying to use this device to be able to um, personalize the information on there, use it for yourself. So we're going to talk about personalizing the device, the settings and the apps, um, and so I'm going to focus first on the settings. Inside of your settings, when you jump in there, there's a lot going on. And most people kind of hover in the first general area, but there is so much more once you begin clicking and navigating your way through. So we'll talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> managing your usage, which is super important um, because, of course, if you're like me and you've got apps on top of apps on top of apps, you start to run out of space. So we'll talk a little bit about managing your uses, how to lock your device, which I think is very important. Um, I've worked with principals in our district. Our principals and administrators also have um, iPads through a grant. And so um, one thing that we really, really stress with them is locking the device um, in the event that that device gets in the hands of anyone else. We'll talk about how to let your fingers do the talking, um, which is really kind of neat. There's some um, neat gestures that you can use. Um, in order to, <clears throat> excuse me, allow your device to become a little more productive. We'll also discuss how to make your fingers do the talking, letting pictures say a thousand words, how to have people and your device respect your privacy, keeping your heads in the cloud, a sleeker surfboard, and built-in apps. If, you, if they build it, then we will come to it. So we'll talk a little bit about all of that. So let's talk a little bit about your settings. When you go in, um, most people hover in kind of the first two general areas. They hover where you see in the screen, you see airplane mode, Wi-Fi. Those are kind of your basic device management. So if I wanted to turn it into a safe mode, access Wi-Fi, use a Bluetooth keyboard or a Bluetooth headset, as well as if your district allows you or your office allows you to use VPN to access their network, you can do that as well. So most people hover right in that general area. They don't really kind of go um, outside of that. What was new when Apple updated their software from iOS 5 to 6 is they added the feature Do Not Disturb. And so you can see right in this area here, Do Not Disturb, 
will allow you to be able to um, prevent people from making FaceTime calls to you, especially like now if you're in the middle of a presentation. Um, and so then you'll be able to say, contact me later, or even not allow the screen to pop up while you're talking. And then notifications is an area that a few people go to. Um, but I always point it out. Notifications, if you, if you look on your iPad, a lot of times you'll see a notification, especially in the app for the App Store. Something is new, something needs to um, be updated, you'll see a little red circle and you'll see a number in that circle. Well, there's different ways to receive different notifications on different apps. And so the circle that you see is called a badge, and that's one way. You can also receive an alert, which is what typically pops up on your screen, or you can have it appear as a banner across the top of the screen. So you can really customize how you want to be able to be notified when something new comes up. And this is not just for apps that need updating. If you use the Gmail app, for example, you can receive a notification when a new message comes in. If you're on Twitter, like I am, you can also see um, a notification for the tweet that comes in that either mentions you or is a direct message or anything of that nature. So there's a lot that you can do in terms of customizing your notifications. <clears throat> the middle section, kind of right here in the middle where you see um, general and sounds and brightness and wallpaper, all of those, I call those your general device MOs. That's just kind of how you want your device, that's how you want your method of operation to occur on your device. And we'll look a little bit in the general. Also, underneath, you can even customize some of the built-in apps. So in addition to telling your device how you want it to notify you, how you want the sounds to come through, how bright you want it, what do you want the pictures to do, which Wi-Fi to use, you can also not you can also customize and personalize the built-in apps that come with it. So it's not like the way the app comes, that's the way you're stuck with it. You can customize that in addition to um, the other settings that are there. And then further down, I kind of split it in between two screens because it was a little hard to capture the whole picture and how you see it. But in addition to the built-in apps, you can even personalize how you want your social networks to interact with the device. So there's so much that you can do. And just when you think that you're done, you can choose to customize apps that you've downloaded onto your iPad. So there's, I mean, once you start getting into the settings, you'll just notice there's so many ways to personalize this device to allow you to be able to customize it and use it for your own either instruction or for your own um, personal productivity. So let's talk a little bit about managing your usage because I, I run into this issue a lot. I get caught <laughs> a lot of times. I get a little app happy, I will admit. Um, I am in Apps Anonymous as I speak, just trying to work through not wanting to download every app I see. Um, <laughs> but once you start downloading apps on your device and start using them, it takes up space. So one of the things that you have to um, kind of keep your eye on is managing your usage. You don't want to be at a conference or be somewhere like today at 4T and say, oh, that's a really great app, let me download it, and then go to do that and realize, oh my gosh, I have no space to download it. So one thing that I do is I kind of keep my, um, keep my eye on my usage. When you're in general, in your settings, on the, on, the left, on the right hand side, you'll see an option that says usage, and you see that on my screen right now. You'll see an option that says usage, and then once you click on usage, then your screen will adjust and you'll see all the apps that you have downloaded. And in addition to the apps you have downloaded, you can go into each individual app to see how much space it's taking up. So sometimes what I'll do is if I'm at a conference or I'm going to a conference the next day, I'm going to some PD where I, I know they're going to be discussing apps, I might take off some of my bigger apps just for the day. They don't disappear. They're still attached to your iTunes account, so you're not going to lose them. But I just remove them from my iPad for the day to give me some more space. Or what I might do is I might click on Show Apps, 
which you kind of see my little my little sun there flashing. I might do show all apps and then pick a lot of the smaller ones and get rid of those if I know I need to keep some of the bigger ones, like iMovie, if I want to make a movie, but I kind of still want to have some storage space. So I can really go in there and manage my usage. And I can do this on a consistent basis. It's not as if I do it one time and then I can't do it again or I can't bring something back and manage it. So I really encourage you to manage your usage. Um, I, I don't do it every single day. I may be doing it on a biweekly basis or as needed if there's a project that I'm working on um, or something of that nature. So that's one way that you can definitely um, personalize your devices to manage your usage. Another way is to lock your device. As I mentioned, um, we have administrators in our district, principals and assistant principals, all of them, through a grant received iPads. Um, and so, of course, working with them, you have to have patience, number one. <laughs> and number two, you have to be careful about the information that you put on your iPad. Now, we're encouraging them to use it for their productivity. So we tell them one thing that you may want to do is you might want to put a passcode on your device. Now, what you see on the screen is just kind of simply how to walk through it. When you first enter, um, in general, as you can see on the top right side of the screen, um, you have an option for passcode lock. Once you do that, um, underneath of that picture, you'll see that um, you will be able to enter a simple four-digit number. It will ask you to confirm. And once you do that, at the bottom right, you'll notice that once your device goes to sleep and it wakes back up, in order to come into the device, it will ask you to enter that four-digit passcode. It's really simple. It's really great. works very effectively. And I encourage a lot of people to use it, especially if you're a teacher in the classroom and you're using your iPad for instruction. You want to make sure that you go in and that you use it. Now, the one thing I will caution you, you do have three tries in which you can get it right. So if you enter in a passcode and it's wrong the first time, then they'll give you a chance to try again. If it's wrong the second time, they'll give you a chance to try again. If it's wrong the third time, your device will lock you out for an extended period of time. It'll give you maybe about seven, I've seen seven to nine minutes, and then after that it'll say, okay, try one more time. If you get it wrong by this fourth try, then you're locked out of your device, and your device has to be reset, basically, to factory settings to get in. Now, you don't lose everything on your device because you can always pull it back down, but if you think about it from the device's standpoint, the device thinks that somebody is um, trying to get in it. So what you'll need to do is go back once you've reset it and pull all your information down. But we, I definitely, um, this is one thing that I'm very strong, especially about when it comes to passwords and security, so I definitely encourage you to um, put a passcode lock on your device. Um, this is one of my favorites when it comes to personalizing the device. There is a switch on the side of your device um, called the side switch. And when, it fir when the iPads first came out, the side switch basically locked the rotation of your device. So if you notice you tilt your device in landscape, it'll tilt, you tilt it in portrait, it will tilt. Um, but then some people say, well, I'd like to use it as a mute button. So then Apple switched it in the software and allowed you to make it as a mute button. But then some people said, well, hey, I don't want a mute button. I want to have lock rotation. And then others said, well, I want to have mute. So Apple finally said, fine, you choose. So they allow you now to use the side switch to lock your rotation. I mean, sorry, to lock your rotation on your device or to mute it. So let me just show you the side switch, as you can see in the image here, is on if you hold your device in front of you so the screen faces you, it's in portrait, and then you kind of start to roll the device over so you can see the side of it. The, the, slide, the side switch is there, and you can toggle it up and down. In your settings, you can choose whether you want that to be the lock rotation or the mute, and you can switch it back and forth. Sometimes I'm like, you know, I want it to be lock rotation today. Other times, if I know I'm listening to music or watching webinars, I want it to be the mute. So you can choose which way that you want to um, have your side switch work for you. 
The other way that your fingers can do the talking, and this kind of is one of my, um, between the two, it's my favorite of the two, are the multitasking gestures. So if, if you just kind of allow me to paint this picture, I'm putting on my teacher hat. Paint up this picture that you're in your classroom or you're at home, you open up an app, you open up an app, and then you realize, oh, I need to go to a different app. So you press the home button, the home screen closes, go back to the home screen, your screen closes out, you open up a second app. Then you say, oh, I need to go back to that first app that I had. So you press the home button again, you close it out, then you go back to the first app. And then you say, oh, well, I need to go to dictionary.com because I have no idea what this word means. So you press the home button again. So all day long, you're pressing that home button. Well, think about after six months of wear and tear on your device, what do you think might be the first thing to go? So I'm really glad that um, Apple came up with these multitasking gestures. And when you turn them on, you can allow your fingers to help you basically multitask between certain apps. So as you can see here on the screen, there's three things that you can do. Um, and let me actually advance the slide just so you can see. You can do a five-finger pinch to return to the home screen when you're inside of an app. So if I'm inside of, let's say, Dropbox, then what I can do is I can use all five of my fingers and pretend that I'm trying to pull the screen off the device. So I have to actually have five points of touch at the same time, five simultaneous points of touch. And when I grab the screen and try to pull it towards me, it'll take me out of that app and into the home screen. So I don't even have to use the home button then to be able to go from the app to the home screen. Another multitasking gesture, and it's the one down here in the bottom right. Uh-oh, I think I moved my slides there. Let me go back. Down here in the middle and the bottom, another multitasking gesture is to swipe left or right to go in between apps. So if I have open Safari and I have the Reminders app open and I have um, just a few other things that are open, a few other apps, I can take four fingers and four simultaneous points of touch and swipe my screen from right to left or left to right, and it will take me in between those apps. So again, I don't have to use the home button and then go to the app. I can just swipe my fingers to go back and forward in between the apps that I have open. Now, if I'm trying to figure out, well, what app was I using? Um, I know I was using one, and then I can't find um, the other one, or what was the other app that I had open? Then in the top right of my screen, my slide here, you can see that you can use four points of touch and swipe upward. So it's almost like you're trying to push the screen upward. And then I can see all the um, apps that I have open at the bottom. There's a little bar that appears there, and you can just kind of swipe from right to left to see all the apps that you have open. So I really kind of like this. It is um, actually made the way I access the iPad a lot faster. I'm able to go back and forth in between apps um, a little bit quicker, and I'm not wearing out your my home button. So these are just called um, multitasking gestures that you have on the iPad. And I encourage you to try them out. Turn them on in your settings and just try them out. Um, they're really kind of fun, and they allow you to get in between your apps as opposed to using the home button. Another um, option that you have in your settings is called the keyboard. Now, you, you'll know um, if you have an iPad that once you turn it on and begin to get to an area where you need to type, you have access to a keyboard that will pop up on the screen. It's kind of a built-in on-screen keyboard. Well, you can customize the keyboard to function and operate in certain ways. Um, you may already be familiar that it has auto capitalization. You might already be familiar of the autocorrect, which gets me in trouble sometimes. I'm like, that's not the word that I wanted. You can turn that on or off. You can turn on or off to check spelling. You can turn on or off to be able to enable caps lock. If you've never used caps lock before, if you're looking at your keyboard on your iPad and you're at a place where you can type, there are two big arrows that appear in the um, 
the two bottom corners of your keyboard, one on the left, right above the one, two, three symbol, and one on the right under the return. If you double tap those, you're turning on your caps lock. Well, you can enable that feature not to work, just if you want to, if it's too much. Um, so that's an option as well. Um, one that I like is this last option that you see here, um, enabling shortcuts. Sometimes we just need to say what we have to say a little bit quicker. So there's an option where you can turn on something called shortcuts, and I'll show it to you. It's right down here at the bottom where you see the, the little uh, green check there. You can establish a certain letter or number pattern and have that equal to be a sentence. So if you see for the first example here, if I on my keyboard type OMW, then it will expand and stretch out to use the words on my way. So I don't have to type on my way. I just have to type OMW on my keyboard, and the iPad will automatically suggest, it. do you want to say on my way? Um, you can also do WAU. I think these two... Um, come standard, where are you, and it will automatically type the phrase, where are you. So it's really neat. You can um, add a new shortcut if you want to. Um, I wouldn't advise using too many because then you might not remember them all. Um, so it's just something to kind of keep in mind. But if you know there's something you use very consistently, like on my way or in a meeting, then you definitely have the option to do that. Something else you can do with your keyboard as a personal preference is you can be able to split your keyboard. And you can see that right here in the middle of the screen. You can be able to split it. Um, it's a really kind of interesting feature. I'm not, not quite sure how I personally feel about it because I'm used to a full keyboard and I actually use a um, Bluetooth keyboard on my device. But a lot of people I've seen use it who are used to kind of the two sided typing. So, um, you can turn on your keyboard to split. You can either do it in your settings or on your keyboard while you're actually there. And let me just show you. Right here at the base of your keyboard, um, you can see the little blue arrow there pointing to it. If you press and hold on that button, then you can split your keyboard into two sides. So now I've got one side with all those letters on it and the other side, so it kind of gives me the feel of a, um, a dual keyboard there. So just a personal preference um, if you're ever interested in doing that. Some people use it and like it, some people don't, um, but I like to point that out to people that you have that feature. Okay. Now, besides always having your iPad with you and accessible, um, there are certain accessibility features that are built into the iPad, and um, one thing that I want to say is that Apple, one thing that Apple is very good at is having accessibility features um, for those who may have disabilities, vision disabilities, speech, even um, um, motor skill disabilities, all of those are included and built into the software. So one thing to take a look at is being able to go in and change some of that to fit your needs. Um, voiceover, if you maybe have some vision challenges and so as you're reading you can't see um, the text, you know, if you look at your iPad, if you have a lot of apps on one screen, the text gets really small underneath the app to see what it is. So by turning on voiceover, you can actually tap on one of the apps and your device will say the name of the app. VoiceOver not only works for naming the apps, it also works for inside of an app. So anywhere you touch, it will allow the device to read to you the section of the screen that you're on. Okay. Now I will say, and I, I do have to give this, this warning, um, VoiceOver does change a little bit the way that your device works. So instead of doing um, maybe a double tap or a one tap, you might have to do a triple tap. And once you turn it on, it will tell you um, 
how your feed, how your device will now change in terms of its operation. But I've seen a lot of people to use it. We have a few principals that have some vision challenges in our district um, that love this feature because they're, they're like, I can't read this tiny screen even when I blow it up. Um, so voiceover is really nice, neat to have. Zoom does the same thing. Um, my dad, God bless his heart, I love him dearly. He got an iPad this year, very first mobile device. He's had a flip phone for years. So I do have a lot of personal training that <laughs> I have to do. Um, but he likes the large text. He wants to be able to see you know, the emails that he has to read for work and things of that nature. So the large text will allow you to increase it. Um, we do have a few students in our district who have color challenges. So you, you might have to invert the colors so that it kind of has that negative look and feel to it where the, the um, background is black, but the words are a little more white, they're a little more bold, so you can do that as well. Um, one accessibility that I, I normally invite people to turn on is speak selection. And I'll show you a little bit later um, as we get closer to some of the other settings how speak selection works. But once you turn it on, then on the right, you see over here on the right hand side of the slide is your options for speak selection. So once you turn it on, you can choose how fast or slow you want something to be read, and you can see that right here in the middle by the check mark. It will either be something as slow as a tortoise or as fast as a hare, and you can even change the dialect a little bit which is pretty cool. Um, so you can change how you want it to read. If you're feeling a little British today, then you can have it read in a, uh, a British dialect. And so I'll, sh I'll show you a little bit later where this will come up with, but I do encourage you to try it out, um, especially if you're wanting to read long passages and try to get through them. Um, it's a really neat feature to have. Another thing that you can do, um, and I, I'm actually currently testing this out. I have a four-year-old son um, who, of course, is just as iPad crazy as his mom and dad. Um, and so you can actually turn on something called guided access. What guided access does is it allows for whoever has the iPad in their hands at that moment in time, so it might not be the owner, to only exist with inside that app. So if I turn guided access on and I can use a passcode to be able to do that, then my son, if I want him just to play in one app and not navigate all over the place, I can keep him and restrict him to that one app. So you see on the screen here, this is what the guided access looks like. Here at the bottom where you see the green check mark, I can say do I want this person to be able to touch, yes or no. Do I want them to be able to navigate, yes or no. So basically they have all the functionality of this app, but they're not allowed to basically go back and forth in between different apps. So I'm pretty much keeping them here, keeping them kind of in a, in a safe spot. Maybe I don't want them going to Safari, or I don't want them going to the app store like my son typically does and buys Angry Birds <laughs> over and over and over again. So I can kind of keep him in there, um, which is really, really kind of neat to have. A lot of people tend to use this with their students in the classroom, especially if you only have a one iPad uh, classroom and you want to share with your students. It's a really nice feature to have to be able to do. Um, so this is called Guided Access, and you can find it in your settings under Accessibility. So settings, general accessibility. Um, for us educators, we love using pictures. We love using digital media. Um, we've just had a lot of meetings this week in my office where we've been talking about Common Core um, and kind of how those standards are going to come into place with technology. Um, and so we know that even if Common Core were not on the scene or new standards were not on the scene, we know that our students live in such a media-rich environment. And so just talking to them or telling them, pretend in your mind that you see something doesn't work. And so using pictures is powerful. Um, and using just digital media is so powerful because that's, that's the world they live in. And so there's a feature on your iPad. It comes built right into this software in your settings called Picture Frame. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, maybe about 10 years ago, you used to be able to go to the store, they were relatively new, and you could buy those picture frames that you would use a flash drive, plug it in, download pictures, and you would be able to um, 
kind of have like a, a moving slideshow. So instead of buying a photo frame or a photo book and having someone sit there and flip through it, you could just turn on this picture frame and it would rotate through these pictures. Does anybody re remember this at all? Use your smiley face if you remember it, because I know I had like maybe three or four of them. <laughs> I had one at home and one at work and one a few other places. Um, so you remember, there were the photo frames and the pictures that roll through. Well, the iPad is created really for displaying, and not necessarily for presenting, but displaying in terms of just displaying information. It has a really rich display feature and screen. So built in to the software, you now have a picture frame. So you can load pictures on your device. You can see on the right side of the screen here, you can choose how you want it to transition in between um, dissolve or origami. You can also choose um, how long you want those to kind of navigate through. Either um, you want them for three seconds, five seconds. You want it to be able to zoom in on a face. If you build a photo album, maybe you want it to shuffle through as opposed to going from start to finish. So there's some really great choices here. Again, it's all about personalization on the iPad. Then you can choose where you want the pictures to come from. Do you want it to come from your photo stream, which is connected to iCloud? Do you want it to come from an album that you've already put on to your iPad? Or do you want it to come from an event that you've built and put on your iPad? And then once you select all of that, when your device goes to sleep, if you look over on the left side of the screen where I have the uh, green check mark here, you'll see that little icon. It's a, a square with a flower in it. It will appear at the bottom right. And then once your device goes to sleep and wakes back up, you'll see that icon. And once you see that icon, you can tap on it and your iPad will automatically begin to go scroll through like a picture frame. So it's just really kind of cool to be able to have that on there. I love that feature. Sometimes if I know I'm going to be sitting at my computer at my desk all day and not necessarily using my iPad, I'll turn my iPad into the photo frame and just kind of have pictures there to show um, of different things going on. So I really, really like being able to use that. Now when we talk about personalizing your iPad and making it work for you, there are some apps that come built in on your device. As you add other apps, especially apps that are like social networks or apps that allow you to customize photos and pictures, um, some of those apps will say, do I have permission to access your photos? Do I have permission to access your location services? And typically, sometimes we say no initially because we don't know what the app does and we want to be able to kind of test it out at first. Well, you can always go back and change that. And so in your settings, in the area for general, there's a feature called privacy. And what that does, it allows you to say yes or no, I want certain apps to be able to use these basic built-in apps that you see here on the screen, on the right-hand side of the screen. So I can say, yes or no, I want you to be able to use location services, or I want you to be able to access my contacts, or I want you to be able to access my calendar, or my photos, or my Bluetooth. And you can turn that on or off. Once you tap on one of these options here, and I'm just going to choose photos, then you'll get a list of apps oops, that are currently using the photos. And you can go in and say, yes, I want you to, um, I want this app to use photos. No, I don't want this app to use photos. Yes, I want this app. And so you can individually choose um, as the list continues which apps you want to be able to access these basic built-in features. So it's really kind of nice to be able, if you said no at first, but then you realize, oh, maybe I wanted to use my location services because it's a map app. Or maybe it's an app that allows me to um, add some editing features onto pictures. So I want to be able to, yes, allow it access to my photos. You can always go back and adjust that. This is in the privacy section, and again, once you get into the privacy section and you tap on one of the op these options like photos or contacts, you can go in even further and decide which of these um, apps in the list will allow you to have that privacy. And I thought maybe that I had the slide on there, but I think I
bitten, so we'll just keep right on moving. Um, one thing that you will notice is that there's a feature in iCloud, there's a feature on the iPad called iCloud. And what iCloud will do is it will allow you to sync some of your device, some of your, some of your information on your device to the cloud. Apple added this with probably the addition of the, um, I'd say maybe the 5 software when they upgraded to the 5. Um, so what happens is, originally when you had your iPad, you would have to plug your iPad in manually to your computer in order to sync the information on your computer. Well now, with iCloud, you can simply log in using your iTunes account information and be able to sync that information across iCloud. So now we're talking about using the cloud, being able to store things virtually, and not having to be tethered to a computer. So now I can sync wherever I go. I can kind of be able to walk through and choose, as you see here on the right-hand side of my screen, I can choose either my contacts or my calendar or my mail to sync. Safari, if I had bookmarks in there, I can choose that information to sync so that in the event something should happen and maybe I have to get a whole new, iCloud, a whole new iPad, I can log into iCloud and be able to pull that information right back down. Um, so that's kind of a really, really cool um, feature to have. iCloud is very powerful. I'll just share very briefly. I went on a, a personal trip to Florida with a girl, with some girlfriends for a birthday party celebration. Got to the pool, ready to enjoy. Was trying to keep my phone near in case my husband had to call or something was going on with my son. I learned the hard way that iPhones do not float in the pool, nor are they protected from the water. So my phone died. I tried everything I could, the rice, the hair dryer, you know all the tricks. Didn't work. So I walked into an Apple store four days later, um, purchased a brand new I iPhone, very painful in my wallet. And when I logged into iCloud, all of my information began to come right back down. The apps that I had synced and saved, the notes, bookmarks, as if I hadn't even lost my iPad, my iPhone before. Now the same thing works for the iPhone as well as the iPad pad, um, as well as an iPod Touch, as long as you have iCloud on there. So I just kind of want to point that out to people. I love using um, iCloud. It just keeps my information going. Um, I have a personal iPad and a professional one, so it allows me to kind of manage my devices. So it's a really great feature to have. Um, the neat thing is I can also go to any computer and navigate to www.icloud.com and be able to log in and see um, the same information. So just another way of kind of managing your device, you can choose what you want to sync um, in iCloud and they give you, I believe initially they give you five gigabytes of storage space, um, but you can also purchase more if you want to. So that's another way to personalize your information, um, a very great way of being able to keep your information with you wherever you go, um, as well as being able to, to manage some of that. Does anybody, just out of curiosity, um, if you could use your smiley face, how many of you use iCloud currently if you have an iPad? I'm always curious to, to see. You can just use your smiley face there. How many of you use iCloud already? Okay, so just a few. Um, it, it's not relatively new at this point. However, people are slowly but surely, I think, beginning to understand um, iCloud and what it's all about. So I definitely encourage you to try it out. Um, see if you like it. See what works for you. Because um, it's really nice in terms of being able to sync and not be tethered to a computer. Now, um, once you get into your settings and you get through the general device settings and then how your device will operate, there's a section that covers the built-in apps. So you don't have to have the built-in apps um, kind of work the way that they're built in. You can choose and customize that. And one thing I encourage people to do is to be able to um, customize some of the built-in apps. 
for the way that you want to be able to use it. And so one of the customizations that I point out to people is Safari. Um, Safari is the native internet browser for the device. You can use it, of course, to search the internet, you know, look up websites, things of that nature. But I also know that I, I use it almost kind of as a, a personal um, management section. And so there's a few things that I do um, in Safari that I've turned on that I'd just like to share with you just so you kind of, you know, have a heads up there on how to use it better. Um, you can change your search engine. Right now Google is still a part of the search engine, which is nice. Um, so when I go and I type in Safari, I can go right there to the search engine for Google. Um, if you're familiar with autofill, basically when you begin to type something, it'll try to remember the last thing you typed that was similar to it. You can use that. Um, you can allow your tabs to open in the background. But right here in this uh, middle section you see on the right-hand side, where it says always show bookmark bar. I always invite people to turn that on um, because you can access your bookmarks and I'll show you that a little bit later. But there's another way that you can basically use something called the bookmark bar to be able to manage your bookmarks a little better, I think, um, and give you a little more access to them. When you turn always show bookmarks bar on, you can then, as you can see on the screen, Right underneath this area where the check mark is, of course, would be where the URL is for the website. Underneath, you now get an extra space bar or an extra bar here where you can save your bookmarks. So instead of me having to click on the bookmark icon and then navigate my way to find my bookmarks, I can now also um, use the bookmark bar feature to have my bookmarks right there across the top. So I can just tap right from that bar and be able to find my bookmarks. A lot of people don't turn this on, and I find that when I show them, hey, turn this on and try it and tell me what you think. Um, they're in love with it. You know, some of the places that you go more frequently, I can have them up top and be able to use it. Um, you can also make folders on your bookmarks bar. So now I rarely go to my bookmarks icon because everything I need is right there in that bar. So websites for my school district that I know I use on a consistent basis, I have it in there in my bar as opposed to information on iPads that I use consistently, I have it there in my bar. So it just allows me to be able to access those websites um, to me in a faster manner. So I really, really, really like using the bookmarks bar feature um, in Safari. It just really allows me to gain access to those devices a little quicker. I mean, I'm sorry, those websites a little quicker. Now, in addition to your settings, and there's still a lot I didn't cover. I didn't talk about how you can manage <laughs> some of the other built-in apps and how you can manage um, some of the additional apps. You can go in and look at that in your settings, but I want to talk about some of the built-in settings, some of the built-in apps, excuse me, that I think really would allow you to um, really personalize this device and some that are, I, I think, some good hidden jewels and secrets that a lot of people don't know. So I'm going to take about five more minutes um, and then we'll switch over and, and Don will actually talk to you about some more specific apps that you can add to your device. But when we talk about personalization, there are some apps that are on the device that come built in that really allow you to increase your productivity. And so I always say, you know, build it and they will come. If you build an app, somebody is bound to use it. Um, somebody is bound to download it, test it out, and try it. So there's three that I want to talk about, and you see them on the right-hand side of the screen. I want to talk about Safari while we're still there. I want to talk about iBooks. I saw a few people mention that in the chat window. And I also want to talk about Reminders, which has come my living to-do list, and I'm not sure how I live, <laughs> live without it. Um, as you can see in the middle of my screen here on the slide, these are the apps that come built into your device. Um, and you can, of course, customize them and move them around and things of that nature. So let's talk a little bit about Safari. Um, we all know that Safari is the Internet browser by choice. You can add another Internet browser if you want to. Um, they have a couple out there. Chrome also has an app that you can use. Um, but in Safari, you can actually manage your bookmarks. So it's really kind of um, <laughs> funny. I was working with the principal the other day. And she was looking for 
she was looking for something, trying to navigate something in Safari. And so I said, well, did you save it as a bookmark? And she said, well, I'm not sure. I said, well, open up your bookmarks. And she had this huge list of 50 bookmarks, things that she had saved from different sites. And I said, oh, my goodness, <laughs> it's making me really nervous. She had a huge list of bookmarks. And so I said, well, did you know that you can manage your bookmarks by folders? And she said, well, no, I didn't know that. And I said, yes, absolutely. You can categorize them so the stuff you have for your school, you can put in a folder. Things for your PD, you can put in a folder. So you can manage your bookmarks by folder. When you do that, you simply click on this edit button that you see right there. Um, it's a little dark, so let me use the smiley face there. You click on the edit button, and then the screen will switch over to allow you to create a new folder. And then you simply move um, the bookmarks into the folder that you choose. And remember, I showed you the bookmarks bar earlier. You can also put folders on your bookmarks bar. So if you know, OK, I need to have Michigan's um, School of Education website at my fingertips. I need to have a few other things at my fingertips. Then I can put those into a folder on my bookmarks bar. The other thing that you can have is a reading list. And that's over here on the right-hand side. I just showed you an example of that. In the reading list, um, I can go through and I can be on an article and I can think, oh, you know, I need to really come back and read this later on when I have more time. I can add that to my reading list. And when I add that to my reading list, it will appear kind of in its own bookmark section. It's still considered a bookmark, but I can put it in my own bookmark section. And then I can always come back and look at it later. And when I'm done, it doesn't go away. It actually goes to, um, I'll put the smiley face there, it goes to a section for all of the reading list. So now I have two sections that I can manage, my unread and then my all, things that I've already read. So that's a really neat feature um, to use in terms of being able to save websites to go back and read later. Um, when iCloud came on board, Apple simply used iCloud initially for you to be able to sync and manage your device. Well, now they've added another feature um, into Safari, built in Safari, that allows you to be able to sync your bookmarks across devices. So sometimes I may be um, looking at something on my phone. I might be out and about looking at a website on my phone. And then I might, when I get home, put my phone up somewhere to charge and think nothing of it. And I pick up my iPad that has the same iCloud account on it, then I can access the very same bookmarks and web pages I was looking at um, on my phone now on my iPad. So it's really kind of cool to be able to look at the web pages on multiple devices. So that's in, that's in your Safari. You don't have to necessarily turn it on, but you can use it um, to look at your web pages across multiple devices. Also, on your iPad and Safari, there are now more options to share. Originally, you could just send it to a mail message, add it to a home screen, print, copy, some of the things across the bottom. Now I can tweet directly from the website that I'm on. I don't have to copy the link, go into Twitter and paste it. And I can also um, put a, post a link on Facebook directly from Safari as well. So that's a really nice feature to have. Um, there's a little hidden secret I'd like to show people in Safari. If you remember back in our settings, um, under accessibility, I said one thing you should really use is something called speak selection. Well, if I'm on a web page and I've turned speak selection on in my settings, if I'm on a web page and I select the text on a web page, I now have two options here, as you can see on my screen. I can copy something, copy what's selected, or I can have it speak to me. So then my device will actually speak or, or speak the words that I have selected inside of um, the text or inside of the website. So it's really kind of nice to have. Sometimes I'll have a website read to me while I'm doing something else just so I can hear um, what it is. It's not exact science. so. Um, Sometimes the words don't match up, so instead of saying live, it might say live, um, but it's pretty close. I would say a good 90% is pretty close. 
something else on your iPad too. There's an option called Reader. Um, I don't know about you all, and I think I saw someone mention it in the chat window, um, but I have a PhD in ADHD, so I'm always all over the place. I'm always looking at like six things at one time. I've got shiny red ball syndrome pretty bad. Um, and so there's a feature inside of Safari called the Reader feature. Let's say that I go to CNN News' website. Well, if you've ever been to a news website or a magazine website or a newspaper website, you know that in addition to the articles, there's also um, advertisements and other things that catch your attention. But when you're on a website, if you look at the very top of my screen, and I'll put the, the uh, smiley face there, if you're on a website that will allow you to do this, you'll see a little gray box that says Reader. Once you click on that, what you'll see is what you see here at the bottom of my screen. You kind of get a clean version of that article. So it strips away some of the other things. Um, it also kind of takes away some of the advertisement and darkens the screen behind it. So now I can focus just in on the article. And what's nice is, and I'll put the smiley face beside it at the top, what's nice is I can use um, the text feature here to make the text bigger or smaller. So in addition to now having a clean version, I can increase the text to be able to fit my needs. Um, iBooks is another place that you can go, and I'll just kind of go through this quickly because I want to make sure I leave some time there for Dawn. Um, iBooks is another built-in app that allows you to customize. You can organize books or PDFs, which is nice, so I can store PDFs in iBooks, but I can also make what iBooks calls new collections. So they don't call them folders, they call them collections in iBooks. So I can make new collections to be able to organize my books or PDFs even further. So if I know I have personal books and I have professional books, I can make a new collection. You can see right here where the smiley face is, there's a new button there. I can make new collections. Um, to be able to organize them even further. I can go make um, books and PDFs will stay there, but I could say in addition I maybe want personal stuff or I might want school stuff or things of that nature. When you're inside of iBooks, you have the feature for a built-in dictionary. Um, you can highlight the text if you want to. You can also use the speak selection here inside of the book, which is nice as well. So it's kind of like having the book read to you. The only difference, of course, is that you would have to highlight this or highlight the selection that you want spoken to you. Um, you can write notes inside the book. You can search for additional text um, references. Or you can share from within the book, which is kind of relatively new because when iBooks first came out, they didn't have that feature. And when you share, whatever you select from within the book, you can share it to either your social networking sites or to mail it to somebody else. So that's really cool as well, um, being able to do that. So if I'm reading a book and thinking, you know, this is really great, I want to send this information to my colleagues or post it on Twitter or post it on Facebook, you can do that. So kind of a little hidden secret there in iBooks. And then finally, your Reminders app. Um, your Reminders app. It's kind of like a running to-do list. Um, it's built in, so you can sync it in iCloud. As you can see on the screen here, it kind of has some different components. Um, over on the right, you see my smiley face. That's where my to-do list appears, my reminders. Over on the left, I can organize them by lists, various lists if I need to, so it's not one large running list. I can put them in categories, so I can say, oh, I want um, a to-do list for or some reminders for personal projects that I have or things of that nature, as well as once I'm in the reminder and I create it, I can actually create more detailed information. I can have it remind me on a certain day of the reminder. I can have it repeat. I can set it to a certain priority, and I can add additional notes. So it might be a website that I know I need to look at when I get in the office and I'm not going to do it now. I can set a reminder to look at that and in my notes section down here at the bottom, I can be able to say, okay, um, I want you to remind me to check out the um, conference schedule for Michigan 4T and here's the link in my notes section.
So it's just a really nice feature to have. Um, it has become my running to-do list. I use it pretty much in anything that I do. Um, if I, you know, if I know real quick I'm out at a school and there's something else I have to do, then I'll go in and I'll customize that. Um, so those are just some other things that you can do while you're inside of Reminders. Those are a few of the built-in apps that are there. There's a lot going on, um, a lot of good, hopefully good tips that you can use. Um, if you could just show me using the smiley face if there was at least one tip that you saw that you could use, something that um, you like, something that you want to try. Um, that way I know at least there's some good stuff. I've seen some good discussion going there inside of the, um, the chat room. So I'm going to turn it over to Dawn now. I know we have a little bit of time left, and I'm sorry, Dawn, that we kind of went past 10 o'clock there. But I'm going to turn it over to Dawn, and she's going to share with you um, some specific productivity apps that you can add to your device. So Dawn, I'm going to click off my microphone in the bottom left corner of the Illuminate window, and then you can click yours on. Okay, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Can you kind of give some thumbs up? If you can, great. Well, um, I see some hands raised. I see one hand raised, so maybe I should address that. You? Okay. All right. So anyway, good morning. Um, I'll go back and forth. I'm going to turn my mic up a little bit. Hopefully um, the volume is not too loud. Um, but I just want to go ahead and just um, thank you, Tia, for such a great presentation and for getting us through the first leg of our um, P and iPad and productivity and presentation apps. What I plan to do, and in a moment you'll see a few images that I have selected for you, um, um, what we'll be doing in this last leg is going through some app specifics um, for presentations as well as for productivity on the iPad. What I do want to kind of mention here as a segue into the next section is that while um, there are so many apps available in the App Store, as you all are well aware. Um, the iPad in and of itself is such a powerful tool and great device. And I saw, as just reading through the chat here, um, that there were so many hidden features and there's so many, you know, hidden pieces of the iPad that um, there's so many things you can do that you may not have known you could do before, especially with the speak selection for your students who may need to have passages read to them such as the shortcuts. There's so many great tips um, innate to the device itself. So in my PD, when I typically present, I like to begin with an emphasis on the native app because the tool is such a powerful tool. And I've been asked on more than one occasion about um, what my favorite app is. And I typically don't even give them an app from the app store. I go with the camera. The camera um, in and of itself, you can do so many things with the camera, from digital storytelling, from um, a wide array of things, having students narrate over some images. You'll see a little bit of that in the um, presentation today. So again, just, um, just so I can see um, maybe with a hand clap to make sure everyone can hear me, volume is good, and that there are no concerns. Can I just thank you? I do see hands clap there, so that's good. Great, 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 great. Thank you. All right, so you can see here on my first slide is I'm putting the P in iPad. Because I have so many slides, we are going to consolidate our presentation to um, a few. And what I kind of wanted to um, show you today, of course, there, hello, um, from Tia and myself. Tia is better known as the template queen, and I thank her for kind of getting us through the first leg of our presentation. And um, I am typically known as the digital design agent which explains why there's 165 slides. <laughs> but at any rate, um, when we present on presentation, I really like to come from um, aesthetic point of view in terms of making sure slides are clean, crisp, and easily um, to, easy to understand by your viewers so that you can have as much an impact as possible. At any rate, your mission today is to just learn new tips, tricks of the trade, and apps for teaching and increasing productivity and blinging we call it blinging your presentations to life. Having said that, I'm not going to address all these apps here. Um, I do want to list this here, and of course, we'll have um, maybe we'll have this archived so you can go back. But I'm going to skip many of these just because of the time we have today. What I want to start with today is um, an app called Explain Everything. 
So again, Tia, just to kind of summarize, Tia went through many of the native apps. I want to use an app and demonstrate an app that you can use across all curricular areas across all content areas, especially as we move towards um, the shift towards Common Core. And you can see the power that imagery has in um, supporting teaching and learning. At any rate, I'll go over explain everything. I may tr touch, try to touch on Skitch a little bit. There's some I just threw in there, one called Minute to Go, Crazy Brain, and 20% Time is not necessarily an app, but just an idea I wanted to share with you guys. In terms of presentation apps, um, tried and true keynote, Nearpod, and presentation tips just to kind of wrap us up. So some of this will kind of be eliminated. So let's go through explain everything. Explain everything is a type of interactive whiteboard application. Just by um, maybe some smiley faces, can I see from the participants, how many of you all um, have had experience with explain everything? Great, I see few, Peggy, Monique. Monette, okay, and I see Aaron there. Thank you guys for giving me that feedback. Well, this kind of just gives me an idea, and Tia so nicely um, placed the app link in the channel for you in the chat room there so you can access it. Explain Everything is an interactive whiteboard. So what you may want to do if you do not have your iPad handy, I'm hoping you did for a Tia session, is to bring your device close to you if you have the app downloaded or once you get it downloaded, you may be able to kind of walk with me through some of this. The opening slide or opening screen for Explain Everything looks like this. And if you already have some products saved, you'll notice them as they appear here on your, um, your windows there. What I want to do is show you how to create a new interactive whiteboard session. So what you'll notice here is that you'll notice that you'll be able, uh, you'll be given the opportunity to select a color template. Again, there's just four choices here. Um, you can select from one of those. Unfortunately, Explain Everything is $2.99. Now, when I downloaded it, um, I think it was free. And unfortunately, it's so hard to tell which ones have gone off of um, being free. I do subscribe to, I know, Sad Face Tia, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I do subscribe to an app called Apps Gone Free. Just throwing that out there if Tia wants to put that in the chat window for you. Apps Gone Free is um, pretty much an application that tells you all the apps that were once um, once paid apps that have now gone free, and the thing is, it's time restricted. So you have to download it within that time frame because it could be free today and gone tomorrow. That's what apps gone free. So you may want to look there, and I'm sorry it costs $2.99, but I, a lot of our teachers, our district has um, subscribed to a, um, uh, we purchased about 660 licenses for Explain Everything. And if you have questions later about the volume purchase program, we can talk about that later. Um, to give you a little bit of background, further background as to my context and what I do, I currently have a or am serving in a hybrid position in that I teach half the day and I work with our iPad program the remaining half of my day. So much of what I'm doing is managing, um, helping to support instruction. We host weekly appy hours so that our teachers can come and just, you know, develop themselves and just kind of get a better idea of what things, um, what apps, what other things to support their instruction um, they can be, you know, um, introduced to. So at any rate, back to explain everything, once you've selected a color template, you can then also, in addition to that, create new projects from existing images. And I'm actually going to walk you through in a, a sample, an example in a moment here, but I just wanted to kind of go through the lay of the land so you know what these icons and buttons represent. So at any rate, to create a new project using existing image, you would collect, click that there. And in addition to that, you also have the ability to export your Explain Everything session to your camera roll, to YouTube, and you have more options here, which we'll talk about those in a moment as well. So from here, let's go over the Settings tab, which is over here on your right-hand side, adjacent to the Information here or Help icon. Under your general, you can kind of turn on and turn off certain features, whether you want to divide your PDF into different pages or your PPT or your PowerPoint or Keynote into different pages. If you want to use a smart pen, you could also turn that on. Under export, which you see is the next tab there, you can um, adjust the resolution, the quality of the imagery, make uh, compressions to your movies if you need to, optimize it for the network, so on and so forth. But again, this is just customized based on your needs so all of our profiles, of course, would look different. In addition to the export tab, we have the record tab. 
So once you're actually in your record feature, um, we, you can also determine what resolution you want your camera to record on, the front as well as the rear camera. Sorry, iPad Oneers, um, I don't think iPad One has a camera on it, does it? Just to make sure. Can someone get, thanks. So no camera there, so sorry. I'm hoping everyone has the iPad 2s and above. But you can definitely alter the resolution there. And finally, accounts. I think this is probably one of the many, many, many powerful features that Explain Everything has or um, possesses. You can connect all of your works to your Dropbox. As you see, I have mine all on. I didn't want it turned on to Facebook, but we'll go through these here. You can connect these to Dropbox, dump them in Evernote. If you have a Box account, you can dump them there. Um, great compatibility with Google Drive, YouTube. Of course, Facebook is an option. I defaulted out of that. Um, Twitter and then WebDAV. If, for those of you who plan to access um, materials on your network server at your school, you can also connect to the server that way and also bring in elements from um, those locations to here. And as you see, I have mine off because most of my stuff is actually on my um, device or in the cloud, as we were mentioning earlier. Hopefully I'm not going too fast, but I know um, our time is limited. I really want to show you what it can do for your students. One of the things or the great pieces of Explain Everything, you can use it as an annotation tool, an animation tool, or a narration tool. Because we're in a static view within Illuminate, I will not be able to model for you the animation tool or the narration tool only because it requires a record feature, but you'll be able to see it on the orientation slide. So very quickly, a lot of information in a short amount of time. Just to kind of walk you through the basic navigation of Explain Everything, you have an of course, you guys can read here. You have pointers, new slides there, a pencil tool, an arrow drawing tool, a text box, text box, excuse me, and whether you want to insert different objects such as photo videos, browsers, other videos and images. Okay. You also have a slide indicator. So the new slide, anytime you depress this green little circle on the new slide, it will add to your, um, your slide tray here at the bottom. So you notice it currently says slide one of one versus slide one of two, slide one of three. So as you add new slides, the numbers here will change. So I'm going to stop for a minute to give you a second to process that information because I know it's a lot. A lot. Um, if you have questions, definitely dump them in the chat. And I'm, Tia is, is um, tag teaming. She and I are tag teaming here. So she can um, definitely address your questions on that as well. Moving right along, which you'll also notice at the bottom, which I can't model because we're in a static view, um, is this uh, record feature at the bottom, and I'll walk through that momentarily. You have a delete tool, the other pieces on your, um, your toolbar here, a laser pointer tool. So if you just want to kind of point around on your interactive whiteboard as you record, you have the liberty to do that as well. An inspector tool, which may in the past was called an arrange tool. This allows you to, um, if you guys have noticed in, for example, in PowerPoint or in Keynote pages, any of those word processing applications, or presentation applications. You can bring items to the front, send them back, layer them on top. That is what this toolbar or this particular option is for. And again, it's called the inspector or arrange tool. If you want to undo something, um, the great thing I like is that these are universal icons. So there you go. If we want to go back and undo something, we can undo it. Screen navigation tool and menu collapse. This just kind of collapses all of this to kind of give you more white space. And you also have color pickers. So this isn't limited to just red, black, and blue, or black, red, and blue, if I'm reading it in the right order. You can also, um, and I don't, you won't see it because, again, it's a static function. When you tap on this black um, uh, color here, you will actually get to see the different shadings of black. So you can get grays. You can get dull blacks. You can get it all the way up to your white, um, from black to white range of colors. You can go here from reds to oranges, fuchsias. So you have so many um, different options here, okay? Pressing ahead, we then have our, on our um, horizontal axis here, we have our record button. The record button, this is a powerful tool if you're having students model a step. And I'm going to walk through a math example for you for those who are uh, maybe at the 7th to 8th grade levels. I currently teach AP Bio, so excuse me for kind of scaling up on the higher end of things in terms of um, what I plan to share. Some of this, of course, can very well be adapted to your elementary grade. But your record features are here. Students can use these buttons to actually narrate themselves walking through a process. 
One of the key features of uh, Common Core is the ability to communicate. Um, our students struggle, at least the students in my teaching context, we struggle with uh, articulation, communicating our understanding of different ideas as well as ideals. And this is one great way to practice those communication skills. And as you know, communication and collaboration um, falls within the net ISTE standards for students, um, just being able to do that. So this app very well supports learning across all curricular areas. It's not just limited to math. It's not just limited to English. You can do this in so many different pieces. You can even bring in, let's say for art, you can bring in a picture, um, some portrait. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Archimboldi, but he used fruit and different types of weird objects to depict different faces. Have the students bring in a picture and have them either narrate features of the picture, have them talk about the historical context of the artwork. So again, so many different pieces to leverage your teaching. Um, so going on, we have export image. Let's say you want to take a snapshot and export it. You can do that there. If you don't want to do an image and you want to do a movie, it's right next door to it. To save your project, um, you would just simply click this next to the last. And lastly, we have our home. So let's jump into the fun. Let's walk through how we can actually do it. This uh, picture may look a little small, but I'll read it for you. It says, problem one, solve the equation. OK, math was not my major, but it's OK. We're going to work this out. <laughs> so the student has this equation here. It's an algebraic equation. Of course, we can kind of walk through and easily solve it. So let's say you have a maybe a bell ringer, a warm-up question, um, or even some kind of more complex. So again, try not to limit it to just this simplistic problem. We can go with a calculus problem and have the problem here, the teacher can disseminate the images ahead of time. Students upload the image. Here's the image the students will see. Now the teacher will say, have the students solve the equation and narrate how you solve this equation. So watch this. I find, I find this to be very cool. So what the students can do, and you're going to actually see, instead of me building each step out, you'll see this holistic, um, the entire image here, only because it would have taken us too long for me to walk through every single step. But what I used here was a text box. So student can drop in. Step one, multiply the factors. So they would use, I don't know if you all can see this highlighted, highlighted A here to the side. That stands for text box, OK? And before I go further, I just want to make sure everyone's still with me. Can I see some smiley faces to make sure I'm not going too fast or that we're all still here? Oh, look at the smiley face. I see it. How cute. Thank you. Whoever put that there, that's neat. All right, so yes, we have a smiley face here. In addition, we have our text box. So step one, this is a text box. Step two is another text box. Step three is a text box. What I then did, I kind of differentiated mine by writing in red and writing in blue. Red on one side of the equation, blue on the opposite side of the equation. So on my left-hand side, I went ahead and started working this problem out. And then I went ahead and did the same for the opposite side. And step two, I used. Well, for both step one and step two, actually, I use this pen here. And again, remember how I mentioned the ability to change colors down here? You can change the color of the pen. So once again, I use this pen feature, and I started writing. And thankfully, I was able to get a, um, a stylus from an organization called Learning Forward Maryland. And I use that stylus to write on there, because it's kind of hard to write out with your finger. But um, essentially, you write out the problem. You work the problem out, as you see I've done here. And the student can actually talk over using this record feature. Um, Mrs. Berkeley, this is how I solved my problem. In step one, I began with multiplying the factors. I took negative 15x, and again, again, just having students communicate their understanding of a given problem. So what are your all thoughts on that? Um, good or not good? Or what do you think in terms of teaching and learning? Because I know we all have different contexts. I love to see in the chat box just kind of how, how um, you think that would be useful for your kids. Annotating is key, yeah, definitely. Um, and a great way, yes, thanks, Heather, a great way to flip your classroom. Of course, students can go home, do this work, bring it back, OK? Um, some districts have students where the one-to-one -one is such that students take their iPads home daily. Our school is not fully one-to-one, -one, so we don't have that model adopted. But essentially, um, they come in, they do their work at home, um, and then whatever they haven't done, on, that, of course, they would have to use the iPad in the building. All right, so moving ahead, once students have finished this, let's say they are making an e-portfolio of all their work over the school year, addressing how they've, uh, um, you know, discussing how they've addressed certain core learning goals, 
and are those things aligned to Common Core standards? Let's say they have a culminating project of an ePortfolio, and this is the standard that you're having the students look at. They can then take this image and dump it or export it, rather, to their camera roll, mail it to themselves. They can even begin creating an iBook. Try that. Have your students create an iBook of everything they've learned over the year in your class. Again, at the high school and middle school levels, we have this sequestered, um, and sometimes it doesn't seem interdisciplinary, but we have this broken off chunking of content areas, and sometimes they don't all mesh together as well as we would like them to. But if you have a great interdisciplinary team, perhaps you can have your students do a ninth grade, um, end of the year, culminating project portfolio from all their different content areas, and they can just begin dumping and curating their work here, okay? All right. In addition to that, you can also dump and remember those extra features, Box, Evernote, Drop. So don't, don't forget, there's so many capabilities here um, feature within Explain Everything. All right, moving right along. In addition to those, you can also save it as an image file. And you can see here, I have this currently, I don't know if you all can see this here at the bottom, but it says Photos. Let me see if I can find my little wand here. Can you see my wand? Oh, yeah, look at that. All right, so down here in the Photos, you can um, dump any image, the one I just made into a photo, you can dump it into iTunes. Let's say there's narration there with a, um, some, some sound, of course. You can have that dumped into iTunes. There's a Dropbox, again, Evernote, all your different opportunities um, to save and share your work. All righty. You can export it as a movie, as I, as I just mentioned as well. Or you can even save it for later. This icon here at the bottom or at the far right here, I'm trying to turn this off, sorry. Um, this icon here is just to simply save, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, the home key is always there, and it's always nice to be able to go back home. There are other popular interactive whiteboards out there, so I don't want to just, um, you know, just drop one. Explain everything is the only one I will go through in great detail, but I do want to uh, make you aware of others. Educreations, how many have heard of this? Smiley faces for those in the room who've heard of Educreations. And not just heard of it, maybe have worked with it. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. I see you all. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I see lots of folks, a lot of smiley faces there. Educreations is definitely another one. Um, also, similar capabilities. So you see here on the iPad, the students can actually diagram if you have a, um, this volcanic image here, or this image of a volcano, students can go in at the lower levels and actually, again, annotate their work, label, diagram, and as they're doing it, have them explain what they're doing, explain and articulate their understanding of that concept. Show Me is another one. Again, I won't have time to go through it, but um, again, that was EduCreation. The first one was Explain Everything, EduCreation, and Show Me. And here's an image from Show Me. Show Me and EduCreation seem to be kind of, they are kind of similar. What I do like about Show Me is that students can actually um, have, very similar to Explain Everything, they can actually go on and explore others' channels, and they can actually pull down some of those interactive whiteboard sessions for themselves and use those in their own articulation of some given concept, uh, concept, con content aerial concept. Dothery is another one, another interactive whiteboard. I wish I had time to go through this one in depth. I don't, but it's an another one that I wanted to make you aware of. But it also acts as a remote where you can connect to your desktop um, using the Dothery app. And again, we won't have time to go through it, but this kind of gives you a quick snapshot of its uh, functionality. It's an interactive whiteboard screencasting, as well as a remote computer control all in one. So Dotary actually is a very powerful tool. And as you see, a lot of the many uh, RAID five-star reviews, the only presentation app you need. And you may have to try that one. And again, we're also different. So different things, different strokes for different folks, I guess is what you could say. Oh, thank you, Erin. It's interesting, too, because you can mirror more than one iPad at the same time. So wait, let's, let me go back for a second and have a quick share out discussion there. Um, and Tia may be able to touch on this later um, uh, as we get to the end of this session, but you do have the ability to use um, AirPlay if you have all your devices, you're on the same network and there are no restrictions. Instead of having students come up to plug their iPads in to show their work, they can sit right at the desk turn over their, the, the AirPlay to them, they can display their work and move from there. And based on what Aaron's is saying, um, he said he loves Dothery, it's revolutionized the way I use my iPad. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Aaron. Very great there. All right, so how would you use your students to explain everything? Very quickly in the um, chat box, can you just give us a quick, a quick, excuse me, a quick teaching tip, quick teaching tool, or how you would actually have your students use 
explain everything. As you drop that in the chat, I'm going to just talk about how I would use, have, it, have my students do it. I'm actually going to show you Skitch in a minute. Um, I would have my students explain um, one of the units we discussed with cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is one of those very detailed, very involved processes. And students, it just usually takes us a, quite a bit of time to get through. I typically just give them an image with no labels and literally have them label out the diagram and literally walk through the process. Typically, you learn something when you teach it to someone else, which is a great. Um, explain and draw the life cycle of a butterfly. Very nice, especially for those younger, younger users. Getting them to use the iPad, um, the earlier the better. All right. I actually use it to present Friday sessions. Graphic organizers create webs. I love it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you there. All right, Sketch, here we go. Crash course on Sketch. Sketch is a product by way of Evernote. Sketch is like the bomb.com if you've not used it. Um, Sketch has so many different, um, I mean, I guess the biggest powerful, most powerful feature is the fact that you can annotate over a wide array of pieces of media. And everything that you've seen in my presentation was annotated via Sketch. If you saw any of the highlighting, and I'll go back just to kind of show you very quickly. Um, all these images here that I've made back here, um, any of the arrows, any of these circles, any of these call outs, any things that draw attention was done via Sketch. So let me get you up to Sketch so we can kind of um, fly on from there. Sketch again, I think it's free. Hopefully Tia can kind of, it's free. Yay. Thank you, Tia. So Sketch is free. And, and um, as I mentioned, you can annotate screen snaps that you've had. It's fully um, integratable across your iPad, your laptop, which I love. I can dump something in my photo stream, pull it up on my laptop, do a quick annotation, drop it into a keynote, and keep things moving. Sketch is a part of Evernote, as Tia mentioned. It's part of their suite of services, as is the other one is Sketch. What is the other Evernote? Um, someone help me out. I'm having a brain freeze right now. There's another application in the Evernote suite that I'm forgetting right now. Um, so we'll come back to it. Someone will help, kind of help me out with that one, I think. But anyway, you can annotate um, your screenshots, photos, web pages, um, anything you have. And you typically do everything from this little uh, menu bar here. Even though it looks like it's um, little and small and doesn't have a lot, there's actually a lot you can do here. So moving right along, for example, if you have a map, you can mark up an image, share it with your friends, share it with your students. Again, I'll show you. Um, a try to show you the actual, um, maybe the theoretical approach, and then show you in applied practice what that might look like in the context of your classroom. You can share a PDF summary to highlight annotations and give quick feedback. Um, of course, these little options, smiley faces, hearts, check marks, questions, those are there too. Um, and this image here, this is actually from uh, Sketch. Um, love white roses. What is this flower? People just asking questions. So you, you can actually use, use this as an interactive discussion in your class. Place an image up. Have students ask questions. Don't label it. Don't diagram it. Just give them the image. Have students start talking around that idea. Similar to a voice thread. If you've ever played around with voice thread, you can put up an image and have this commentary across your classes um, You know, on a given topic, given, given image, given um, idea. And in this case, it doesn't have to be um, you know, too detailed. The question is, what is this flower? Students can have that discussion and dialogue without you being there. So to start Sketch, I'm going to give you a quick crash course on how you start with it. Um, you download the Sketch app. You can't see it in the background, but I've logged in already. So unfortunately, you, you won't see me, you know, walk through the process of logging in. Once you log in, you'll see this plus here where you can either take a photo that you want to annotate, choose a photo, create from PDF. Power there, what about your primary resources? Your primary source is especially big with Common Core. Pull up those primary resources and have students annotate right on the document, okay? Um, draw on a map. Um, if you want to have students maybe, you know, determine distances from one area to another, maybe they can kind of show the pathway and maybe, you know, use some kind of algebraic equation or something else to determine distances or whatever. Uh, start with a blank or you can capture from the web. I'll only probably just show you choose a photo today because of our time. So here's my camera roll, all the different pieces and albums that I have. I'm going to pull something off my camera roll. 
And here's the electron transport chain, the thing you all dreaded from high school. I still dread it even though I teach it. But anyway, um, so here's the image. Very intimidating, at least initially to my students, just because of some of the skill sets that they come with. The others, some of them are ready to go with the others are not. Um, but this visual um, has, has, has great power in that um, what if we just kind of wiped away all of the words? So I took something, I took one of the tools, and I'll show, I'm just kind of going back and forth here. So here are all the labels. What I did here is using this feature here, I don't know if you can see that over there to the right, I also have it arrowed out in yellow. You can actually kind of um, disguise or kind of, not blacking out, but yeah, in a way, blacking out the terms and have your students go in and you can kind of circle them to highlight it for them. Have them go in and actually narrate. Take this picture and sketch, then dump it back into explain everything. So look at how I'm trying to connect everything here. Take this image and again, and this is great because not only we're not teaching apps in isolation and we want to get out of this one app for everything. We, we may be doing a variety of apps to really drive and support our instruction and again that's just helping to further their technical capacity and their technical skills um, as it relates to 21st century thinking, being able to do these types of things. So they pull an image down, annotate it in sketch, dump it into explain everything, and have them narrate right over the process. What happens first? Oxygen comes in, electrons are pulled down this electron transport chain. We're able to generate ATP. All of that is a powerful tool. So again, I know that's high school level, um, but I'm really hoping that someone can take something away from this, even though take your image, it could be the, the butterfly image. You know, maybe you can have them walk through um, the different stages and l unlabel them, you know, kind of obscure what the titles are, have them label it out and then dump it in to explain everything. So how could your students use Sketch? I think we have already kind of talked about it um, when we mentioned about the interactive whiteboard. We'll kind of use those in tandem. So I'm going to keep things moving here. Minutes to go, if everything shows up clearly, I'm just going to mention it. I won't teach it. Minutes to go is an app. Productivity, we lose so much time. We, I don't know if you all are all on 90-minute blocks or not. Well, at the high school level, we do a 90-minute block, and a lot of time is wasted. I think 90-minute blocks are great for um, the teaching context for those who have, you know, your lab classes or your family and consumer science classes or those types of things. But what if you're in one of those classes where, like English, for example, and 90 minutes, you know, your students are, you know, it's getting to be warm outside. At least it is over here in the west, east coast, of course. Um, you know, spring and summer are starting to kind of uh, creep up upon us slowly. And the students really just don't want to be sitting for that long time. So time yourself, time and activity to make sure you maximize your instructional time. I always use a timer. A minute ago, you can actually use two modes, a timer mode. So I'll just point them out, timer mode or clock mode, which I'll show you in a moment. And let's say a 10-minute activity. You want students to brainstorm an idea. Um, maybe it's labeling that diagram for 10 minutes. They're doing their labeling and then come back. You can even give them a little message. You may not be able to see it because it's kind of small here, but it's a customized message that I entered. Please put your pencil down. So once you hit start, the clock begins to run. You can actually have it um, set on different intervals. You can do five hours. Who will need a timer for that long? But okay, it's there. 60 minutes, so on and so forth. Each minute gets displayed at 60 minutes or less. Okay? So it tells you even what time the alarm will sound. The alarm will sound at 5.55 a.m. Um, so you have 10 minutes from that time. And um, again, you can pause it. Um, you can have notifications at five, at the five minute mark, at the 15 minute mark, so on and so forth. So I just wanted to throw this in there just, just as a, um, you know, a throw out there for productivity. There's a clock, um, a clock mode as well if you wanted to kind of, of course, no one wants it to go off at 1 in the morning, hopefully not. Again, you can customize your message, so on and so forth. Same thing on the clock view. It tells you what time your clock will stop. All right, I'm going to stop here. Any questions or anything anyone needs me to either re-explain? I know I'm going kind of quickly. Um, and it's mostly because of how much I really wanted to share with you. Oh, thank you, Catherine. How sweet of you. I need kids to present orals and watch and grade their own pre Oh, watching and grading your own presentations. If I had time, there's this app, and hopefully, T, I don't know, can you research this one out for me? If you have time, there's an app that you can actually develop your rubric on the iPad. And what you do is you just go through and you click on the iPad 
the different um, the areas that the student, I think it might be called easy rubric. I can't recall. I, I use it, but I can't think of the name off the top, and I didn't include it in my presentation. But you build out the rubric, and on your iPad, you literally tap the area that the student uh, gained, 43201, based on what you established, and at the end, it gives them a grade. It is so cool. So hopefully, Teal will be able to find that for us, and um, if we're able to, we can pull that up. Crazy Brain is another one. I won't go through this long, but how many of us, uh, maybe just with a smiley face, have done um, Lumosity? I love Lumosity. I don't know if any of you all have tried it, but if you have, if you can kind of throw up a, a happy face to just kind of let me see here. Thank you, Tia, for posting that in the chat. Um, Lumosity, just learned about it. It is so awesome, Peggy. It really helps you develop pieces of thinking, so to speak. It helps you to exercise your brain, essentially, in areas of uh, problem solving, flexibility, um, speed, accuracy, and memory. And I was having so many issues with mem remembering things. I have three small children. And so, you know, keeping up with who's doing what, did I leave a child here? Um, Lumosity really helps you with just increasing your ability to remember. They even um, do a metric where it starts your initial, um, they call it your brain, not your brain mass index, I forget what it's called, it's BMI. I can't forget, remember what the M for. Somebody can help me if you care to, but. Um, and it measures and tracks your brain performance over however long you decide to train. So almost like exercising for your, your brain. So guess what? Lumosity does not have an app, but Crazy Brain does. It's just like Lumosity, but it's free. Uh, Crazy Brain, thank you, Kathy. Crazy Brain is developed by Lab 8, and it's an app, and the, uh, the activities look just like the ones in Lumosity. The same exact, um, Lumosity does have an app. Is it free, Tia? Not sure. Um, I did pay for, okay, they have a premium account that you can pay for, and thankfully I was able to get the premium account, but with Crazy Brain, it's the same thing. Again, you can have your students or you, um, for productivity, just do something that stretches their mind. Um, all learning doesn't have to always take place um, directed or contingent upon the teacher. Again, students and um, learning should be personalized and custom to the student, and sometimes they need some things to kind of stretch their brain. So here are the areas that you can work on in brain uh, BPI. There it is, brain performance index. Thank you. Um, so speed, problem solving, as I mentioned, so on and so forth. The only irritating thing is you get your ads at the top, but it doesn't bother me too much. I just um, work away on it. And um, again, it shows you scores, um, how your brain has shifted over a period of time, so on and so forth. So again, that's productivity, just to kind of help increase your time with that. 20% time. Um, can I see a, maybe just by show of hands this time instead of smiley faces? How many have heard of 20% time? One person. Peggy, okay. Anyone else have heard, has, has heard of 20% time? All right, well, good. I'm glad to, to be able to share with you. 20% time is something that Google um, developed. Google, I have heard, is like the coolest, one of the coolest places to work at because of their approach to innovation, creativity, and development. They give their workers um, time on task, 80% of their time is they are working strictly on whatever their daily tasks are. 20% of the time, they tell them to go play. Go play means go develop a product, do something you want to do come up with some new innovative strategy, and look at all of the amazing products that have come out of that 20% time. Has anyone ever heard of Art Project? When I tell you it is like the coolest thing, it is like the coolest thing. I teach science, but I'm also, I love art, I love art history. I don't, I'm not able to do as much with it as I like to, but let's say you have a group of learners and you can't take a field trip out of your building. Find up maybe a picture of, I don't know, maybe some image, a Mona Lisa, so I'm just throwing something out there. Um, the Mona Lisa, they can pull up this image and, again, take that picture, dump it into explain everything, you get the flow here, put it in sketch, have students talk about this piece of work, have students integrate historical aspects of the work. That is one of the products that came out of 20% time. Um, and, again, how had they not, maybe they may not have had that product unless their workers had the time to just go and play and innovate. Google Mail came out of 20% time, surprisingly. Google Talk. I don't know how many of you all use Talk, but I do. Google Earth didn't come out of 20% time, but guess what? Google Sky did. If you've not played with Google Sky, it is phenomenal. I, there's so many different, you know, kicks and giggles to the application that 
it's hard for me to learn everything, and I don't see how people, it's hard to master everything, but Google Sky is so phenomenal. It, it goes through the entire solar system. Um, it shows you everything in context. It gives you an idea of scale and size. Great, great, great applications for, um, for math, um, for astronomy, for physics, all of those different approaches um, can be addressed through a product like Google Sky. But again, 20% time. Uh, Google News also came out of 20% time. So what would we do or what would happen if we gave our students 20% time? Structure and factor it and do it. You know, be intentional about it. Take a risk. Give your students maybe one day a week. Maybe you wouldn't want to do this every day. But maybe beginning at the end of the week on Friday, 20% factor out what, how much time that would be in the day. And of course you would have to, depending on the age level, of course it has to be structured. We're not saying, you know, have your students, you know, we want them to go play, but we need them to play and let them have structured play. Um, maybe give them a little bit of the day to learn something within your content area that they've never learned before. So for example, I teach biology. My students typically love when we get to body systems, growth stuff. I love growth stuff. I love showing them, you know, crazy images. They're like, ew, stop showing us. Um, but I love going through those pieces. And there's some ideas I just can't touch on because of time. So give them 20% time. Hey, go learn something that you want to learn, become master in it, develop a presentation, come share with the class. That can be like a weekly share out, you know, for your kids. And then again, using those um, other tools we shared and other tools that Tia shared with the native, taking pictures. They can do a 20% time. I'm telling you, it would revolutionize your teaching. It would revolutionize your students. That their teacher would invest the time and energy to give them time to do and learn something that they want to learn. And this is what Sir Ken Robinson talks about in creativity. I'm sure many of you have seen his TED Talk. He talks about um, Western, Western schools and how we've just lost, and we're trying to, we're trying to, we, there's a, a, a very intentional effort to bring back creativity in the schools. How can kids be creative unless we give them the um, creative flexibility and time and space to do it, but do it in a safe manner? Do it under the, I guess, pretty much the protection of their teacher to go and be creative. All right, so we're coming down the last leg of our presentation within about eight minutes of the end here. So let me tell you what I wanted to do for presentation apps. I'm going to skim through this. Um, some of this um, may be useful, some may not. So I'll omit many of it, many, uh, many pieces of this, just because I want to really get to some of the apps. You all are familiar with Keynote, I'm sure. Um, just so you know, the um, iPad also has a Keynote application. Um, just very quickly, I won't walk through how to start a presentation, but you can. Eight minutes, thank you very much. All right, so um, looking here, we have themes you can choose from. Um, students create presentations on their iPad. And again, share them out using AirPlay, okay? So this is just a presentation tool that you can use on the iOS device. Again, I won't go through all the features. I'm just kind of clicking through what you see here. I really, really, really want to get to Nearpod. So that's where I'm going now. Nearpod. Uh, show of hands, anybody use Nearpod? I'll wait to see some responses here. A one hand raised. Any others who use Nearpod? Aaron, thank you. Let's see, who else? Anyone else? Okay, great. So Nearpod, um, our math department has been on full board with Nearpod. Nearpod is like really, really awesome. At any rate, it's uh, free in the App Store. You can pull it down. Maybe Tia can drop a link there for you if she gets the time. Here's just a picture of our, some of our learners um, working with Nearpod in their math classes. So let me tell you what it does in a nutshell. Um, there's a teacher, I shouldn't say version. Before there was a teacher version and there was a separate student version. They've now integrated the two where the teacher and student sign in on the same page, but just in different areas. So let me walk through the functionality of Nearpod for you very quickly. It's an all-in-one um, program that you can use to present and engage your students through a collaborative learning environment. Again, collaboration is one of those 21st century skill sets that our students need. So what you do is, let's kind of focus in on the teacher's view. As you notice, the teacher's view will look very different from the student's view. The students will only see um, a limited portion of what you see. In your presentation, you control what the students are seeing. So if you're worried about those students who have um, tendencies to drift off, remember how Tia walked through guided access? This is kind of like your guided access, but using the iPad from an actual app, okay? So what this does is you can 
upload a PowerPoint, for example, and interactive uh, questions all throughout the presentation. The slides you see here are actually from Nearpod's site, but every presentation has this five-letter pen. And what you do with the presentation is you share out the pen with your students, and you'll need two devices in order to do this. You'll need the teacher device, you'll need the student device, as you kind of see back here, um, because again, there's two views. So I couldn't even model it and show you the student side because I had to have the second iPad here in order to demonstrate the student side of things. But essentially, you walk through, and what you do is you drop interactive questions as you walk through your presentation. The students will enter a pen on their device. They enter their name. That's intentional so that you can track the students' um, responses as they go through the presentation. Um, the teachers swipe, and as they swipe through, you can, act, you can pose a poll. You can place a Q&A there. You can have students draw something. You can have a quiz, a video, a slideshow. But again, this is all controlled by the teacher. And what I mean by that is students aren't going to other, um, other slides in the presentation. They're keyed in on what you're doing. So again, drawing. Um, you can ask a question, match each wonder of the world with the country where it's located. So students would see this. They would then click on what that is. And then you get in real time a poll or the survey results of your students' responses. What's your favorite new wonder of the world? And students can then again answer there. Um, quizzes, sharing a web page there. And again, I'm kind of breezing through this. Students can also work on Nearpod, um, kind of in the Nearpod homework feature, which is where you can assign a given um, presentation. And if students have devices at home, they can access from home. Um, they even now have preloaded lessons in there, which is so cool. So let's say you didn't have the time to pull something together. You can look at the wide array. Um, they have the Industrial Revolution. There's your social studies component, your science component, what's the matter, universes, galaxies, and solar systems. I'm sorry, universe, galaxies, and solar systems. Um, functions, you have your math, and they're all aligned to common core. You don't even have to go look for the standard. They're all there. Um, so this one is in social studies, the Industrial Revolution. This is actually a case study that they use to present to students. You may start off with your objectives. And again, this has all been developed by the uh, folks from Nearpod and whoever they have that are contributors there. But list at least one positive and one negative effect industrialization has had on your life. So what the teacher does is then share this. It turns over to the students. Again, you will not see the student view because I'm in the teacher mode. Students can then put their responses. The teacher then controls the bringing back together of all the students. So you can now get your real-time data. You get to see where the misconceptions are and not have to wait two weeks for your unit test to find out what your kids do or don't know. And again, as I mentioned, I don't know if you can notice here, but the Common Core standards are provided AEE.4, um, Divide Numbers and Scientific Notation. This is from the math section of um, Nearpod. Um, and it also gives you the links there, and that's free. So those, all these lessons here are free. The French Revolution's there, the moon there and back. I mean, there's so many things there that you can reference. Um, I would ask how we can use um, Nearpod for teaching and learning, but because of the time, I'm going to kind of just bring this on in. Um, I did have a video, but we won't show it. It's pretty much as this of a student um, walking through his experience of using Nearpod. Um, as we come to the end, I'm um, going to just wrap up here and just mention there are other ways that you can use to present. You can use Keynote Remote for those of you who are familiar with that, to uh, walk around your classroom and not have to stand at the device, your computer itself, to control your, um, your key, Keynote. You can do it from your cell phone. You can do it from your iPad. Um, you can use your iPad-specific adapters, the dongles here, your VGA cords to present. So this is the technical side of presentation. You can mirror your device, take your device and mirror it to your laptop using a program called Reflector, for those of you who are familiar with that. And again, I know I'm going quickly here, um, but I wanted to make sure um, that I finished in time. Thank you all so much. I'm going to turn this over to Liz, and um, thank you guys so much for being um, active and willing participants in today's session. You guys have a great weekend. Fantastic. This was 
so jam packed with information. I couldn't take it all in as the moderator either um, because I can't wait to watch the recording and I can kind of stop and pause and go through all these different applications and the amazing features that Tia shared with us. I am so glad that we had Tia and Don kick off our 4T conference presentation. I knew it would be awesome because they always are. So thank you so much to both of them for just rocking this presentation. And I posted the session evaluation link, so please give them some feedback on their session and let them know what you liked and, and didn't like about the, the session itself. And we have our next session, we have a session going on right now with Peter Benson on Scratch, which is um, well populated, but we also have another session coming up at um, noon as well. Uh, so, and that one uh, is focusing on uh, Twitter, I believe. So, uh, please join us back again for that. And uh, thank you again to Tia and John Don. This was just awesome. Tia just posted a link with all, a, a link with a document with all the links in it. So, thank you, thank you again. It was fantastic. <laughs>